Good evening. It is Tuesday. And as you all know what Tuesday is for me, it's for me still a year and a bit later, one of my favorite days of the week. Why? Because I get to play with you. Welcome, Donna. Welcome, Dennis. Um, so tonight I am back from vacation. I went to Curacao. That was really, really great. I got burnt to a cinder. My face is burnt. My shoulders are burnt. My back is burnt. My, everything is burnt because my bikini was the size of a postage stamp, literally. <laughs> Look, what's the point in going on vacation wearing a bikini and it's like really, it's like a flag. You got a flag <laughs> on your body. You might as well a bikini that's really small. So my bikini was just enough to cover the crack of my bum and my nipples. <laughs> and now I'm paying the piper because I am completely burned, right? I don't know who told me, but again, I forgot that I'm allergic to sunblock and I tried a new one. And of course I got burned and uh, hey, but I'm back. I had a great time. Curious, is very lovely. The people are absolutely wonderful. Shout out to Varushka, my friend in Curacao, for hosting me and taking me to a really great steakhouse. And But the people are really nice. I got free rides um, by the people. They really, I really felt, felt taken care of. I saw my first um, um, at live sea animal show, which I saw um, sea lions. Terrible. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> It was so sad. I thought I was having a wonderful moment. Like when I was walking across this bridge across the water, I saw these two sea lions and I'm like, oh my God, sea lions. They're just like bobbing up and down. I thought, oh, maybe they came in from the ocean. Oh no. That was their little, how, that's just where they lived in that little sort of, it was, oh. it was pretty wide and big, but you know, they're so trained that what they do is they just go back and forth and back and forth and then they look up and they go back and forth and then the alarm some kind of alarm goes off when it's time for them to do a show and they go and they sit on this uh, raft thing that's floating around or sit on the side and they literally entertain the fish you know it was it was really sad and i was making up this story like guys follow me follow me i'll take you into the ocean no noreen we can't come with you they feed us here but if you go free and go into the ocean you can get as much fish as you want oh no noreen we entertain and we get fish here we can't leave it's scary out there <laughs> I, was, I, was like, I was making up this whole story <laughs> I think I'm the mad one, not the fish. But um, it was so, so sad. It was so sad. I, I don't know. I, I can't talk about it. And they had dolphins and stuff. I would not go see the dolphins. I couldn't. That would have just like totally ruined my life. Hi, guys. Thanks for being on the show. So tonight we have an amazing guest. We have Anna Loth. If I don't mess up your name, then it's not a show. I mess up everybody's name. Lotha Rotman. And Anna is from, Hannah is from originally Austria, you said? Born in Austria. She's born in Austria, lived in? In several countries. Several, several countries. Grew up in Belgium. Grew up in Belgium. And she's now here in New York. And so Anna owns the um, foundation, not-for-profit foundation, Palms for Life. So, Anna, I will give you the pleasure of introducing yourself because we're going to talk about all what you do, why you do it, how you came about doing it. So, introduce yourself to the people. Thank you very much, Noreen. You're it's welcome. a pleasure to be here. Um, so, um, a few words about me, but probably the first words about me are just two. Mm -hmm. I'm a global mother. Oh, okay. This is how people call me these days. And I feel that at this time of my life, mm -hmm. I identify fully with being a global mother. And I'd rather be a global sex <laughs> well, no, okay, Especially, I see the motherhood as a person who loves her children, uh -huh. who stands up for them, defends mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. educates them, mm -hmm. feeds them, mm -hmm. defends their rights. Mm -hmm. And I have that feeling that I have a sort of a life mission uh -huh. to be a mother for 
everybody who can take me and is as a mother. A, is just interrupting you because you just no, said please. something that was really great. <laughs> so is this something that you've <clears throat> always wanted to do or is this something that is just like as you've gotten older you've stepped into? No, I think it is part of my very nature. Mm -hmm. I think that even as a very young child mm -hmm. I had a natural way of reaching out to others. Mm -hmm to loving others, mm -hmm. to wanting the best and protecting others. Mm -hmm. And I was in charge of my little brothers, for instance, when so they grew up, on them. I practiced so much on them, exactly. And then, and then later on, I started uh, my international career when uh -huh. I was 26 years old. And I arrived in Burkina Faso. Oh, Burkina with, Faso. Yeah, mm -hmm. no. At the time, it was called Upper Volta. Upper, Upper Volta? Volta. Mm. And the capital is Ouagadougou. So, Do you speak the language you speak? Okay. No, they have several languages, but one of the languages, the official language there is French, mm -hmm. oh, which yeah. okay. I speak. So mm -hmm. that was very easy. But mm -hmm. they, they have other important they languages. Speak English there? No, they don't speak English. English. It's okay. a West African yeah. country and so under, I mean, has <clears throat> been colonized previously by nice. France. And yeah, so they speak French, mm -hmm. but they have um, a local language, which is the majority of people speak a language called Moré. Okay. So, uh, but that language I don't speak. But when I arrive there, so let's go back a bit. So, yes, you, <laughs> you arrive in Burkina Faso, right? Yes. Burkina Faso, right? And what were you doing there? Like, were you visiting? Were you on vacation? What were you doing? Was you well, working? No, yes, it was my first job overseas. Mm -hmm with the UN. Okay. I was hired to be a um, junior professional officer. And what did that mean? It means um, you enter, you start your career with the UN mm -hmm. and uh, Belgium at that time, because I was a Belgian, I had become a Belgian citizen. Okay. Um, Belgium sent a certain amount of people every year to the UN, young people, so that they can be exposed to the UN world. Right. And I was one of them. And they gave me three years under the Belgian sponsorship to be working with the UN. But after those three years, I was taken up by the UN and I continued my career with them for many, right. many years. So your title was what? I was, um, when I arrived in Burkina Faso, I was a junior professional officer and I was working in the home economics department mm -hmm. of the Ministry of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. in, and what uh, did you actually do? <laughs> what I actually did was, you know, I worked with, that was so beautiful. I worked with local group of women mm -hmm. because, you know, those, those societies are very interestingly organized. Right. Um, they have traditional, traditionally they're organized by gender and by age. So mm -hmm. in the communities or in the villages, you have groups of young girls, you, groups of young men, um, of the girls after they have been initiated, a mm -hmm. group of the boys after they have been initiated. But then you have also the group of the young women, mm -hmm. the young women who are the ones who do all kinds of works. Um, they do very often the most difficult tasks in the villages. And what would, um, that, what would that be like? They, oh, they started the day collecting water, okay. collecting wood, preparing some basic food, getting some of the basic grains mm -hmm. that they have. Um, some of them go to the market, they sell a few things, a few mm -hmm. tomatoes here and there, uh, but they, they take care of the children. But then they also have assigned to them a piece of land, a mm -hmm. communal land. And one of the tasks of my unit, of my project, was to teach them, teach them to grow crops that would give them some form of income. Okay. And in that case... Had was, you ever grown crops before? Never, of course. <laughs> never. But, you know, this is why I was a junior right. uh, professional officer. They learned with me. Uh -huh. I learned with them. Uh -huh. It was all learning. And, um, and I met with them. And I learned very quickly. Also, there was a, a senior expert who I was working with. Mm -hmm. And I went and when, with When you say... And, I mean, when you say that you were doing crops and planting crops to give them sustenance or some kind of sustainable food or whatever were you actually were you actually digging in the ground or were you like supervising no you know as a matter of fact uh -huh. um all the people and throughout my career i can say this as a as a common 
uh, information for, of all the people that I've ever visited and mm -hmm. worked with in Africa and in Latin America, they know. These people know a lot. Of course. They know how to grow their food. Oh, they, they know do. how to survive. Of course. of course. They know all of that. So of I, it's not much that I have to teach, but some basic things that you had to teach them was, for instance, what's the value of your work? Oh, okay. Yeah? If you spend some time working on the field and you have to put a price to those peanuts or to those tomatoes, how will you determine a price right. that value. is value, that is fair for you, that's good for you, right. that will help you live and have a livelihood right. from the food that you grow? Right. This is a concept that is new because, of course, they live traditionally in an economy where things are just exchanged. Butter. But in the modern market economy where the currency comes in, um, you have to uh, understand better the different rules of the game. Right. And so there is a new learning to acquire okay. about that. All right. So basically, let me just pick up what you put down. So you said that, like, you weren't helping you weren't teaching them how to grow the crops because they already knew how to do that Didn't know. so what you were teaching them was to put an economical value on the their labor that's exactly right. it and yeah. so when you what was that like for them when you came in and started to have a economic it's it's not that they didn't have a value i'm clear they had a value because they had an exchange situation i'll give you nuts you give me green right or mm -hmm. i give you nuts and you do my hair or something right exactly so you're teaching them so what was the what was the occurring how did that occur to them well you see um this is how things differ very much from when you have a project or an idea and you write this on a paper mm -hmm. and you then go on the ground mm -hmm. and you discuss things with the population and things are very different mm -hmm. like for instance when you introduce a new concept uh, it is important to understand that sometimes people don't even know how to write and how to read. Right. And then numbers, you can write down a number and you suddenly realize it doesn't mean anything to them. Right. So when you try to introduce these new concepts, you have to also verify locally <clears throat> excuse me, what people already know right. and what is new to them. And then it takes a lot of patience and work to start introducing some new concepts and even teach uh, some basic literacy, mm -hmm. but it is um, taught is in, in its functionality right. in order for them to be able to use it. It's not that you put people in a classroom mm -hmm. and you teach them things. And it's on the job learning. It's on the job learning, yeah. exactly. So we're going to come right back when we'll continue this story. You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network. Did you know you've been playing poker your whole life, even if you've never played a hand of cards? Hi, I'm Ellen Lakin, author of Poker Woman and host of the new show, Poker Divas. On the show, I talk about how poker strategy helps you win in business, life, and love. Tune in live every Thursday, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network. Are you stuck in a rut? Negative thoughts, feelings, and conversations got you down? Hi. I'm Noreen Sumter, The Potentiator. Tune in every Tuesday at 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time and listen for new ideas on my show, Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way, on talkradio.nyc. Who do you want to connect with? Are you an entrepreneur or intrapreneur looking to build your following? Welcome to our show. Follow, Follow Me Friday, Friday with Joan and Priya. Tune in every Friday at noon Eastern on talkradio.nyc. We're, We're your digital, digital connectors. connectors. Woo woo! What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Talking Alternative Radio, 24 hours a day.
Hi, this is Noreen Sumter, and we're back on Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way. And I'm speaking tonight with Hannah Lof Lofa <laughs> <laughs> Rotman. <laughs> Look, if I don't mess up people's name, it's not a show, okay? <laughs> so we were talking about Anna's first um, time in um, Buc Boca Buca Burkina. Burkina Faso. I do know that word. I dated somebody from Burkina Faso. And um, she was talking as a young 26-year-old landing in Burkina Faso and teaching certain understandings, right? <clears throat> so... We, I was saying to her on the break that, you know, as a Westerner, when you go to a foreign country or what is deemed a third world country, one has to go in with a, I would say, a profound level of respect and understanding of what people are up to. Because with our Western eyes, we see all kinds of devastation, right? We see all kinds of poverty, all kinds of nonsense, right? But it's not necessarily so. We have to, like, really reposition ourselves and really look at these people have been surviving without our technology for hundreds of thousands of years and we have to respect what they know and if we're going to support them we have to integrate it into what they already know absolutely so, yeah yes absolutely this is one of the most important knowledge that we develop mm -hmm. as we do our work in the developing world right. uh, we learn how to discuss with communities how to understand the way they operate mm -hmm. and like for instance if you arrive at a community where you know that who ultimately has to make a decision and you meet with the women and you know that they will never make a decision without the men mm -hmm. being present or without them having a moment to discuss it with the men mm -hmm. after you leave you can't meet with them and say we need you guys to make a decision right now right. because it will be they will be intimidated and they out of respect they won't really contradict you openly but they will not be very happy to be part of a project they don't feel they won't feel comfortable they will be afraid that their husbands or their compañeros you mm -hmm. know in latin america will be angry if right. they are shut out of these conversations right. and of any decisions so we have to know that so and so and, it's not like western um, no. with female ideology like yeah. i am woman hear me roar, and you don't tell me what to do <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and and is it because uh -huh. it's just out of respect, right? It's not that yeah. these women are weak in any way. Oh, no. These women are very strong. In fact, you see, I mean, there is so much power in their hands and in their everyday life. I mean, they hold those families and those structures together mm -hmm. and very often you know men drink a lot mm -hmm. in some latin american countries mm -hmm. that's a reality you go to these villages and on sunday or monday morning you see those strong women carrying those men who are completely drunk on the ground they carry them home and they will drag make them, them they drag them home right exactly they're strong so it's just it's, it's just, so basically what i'm hearing is just a form of acknowledgement it is it yeah. is an acknowledgement it is a respect and when you do that then they smile at you and they like you they accept you and then they open up right. and when they open up it is a wealth of information that you get from them right. they even allow you to go into their kitchen and once you're in the kitchen you thing. ask oh how do you do that oh how do you grate the coconut how do you get the milk out of that coconut right. oh and how do you store your potatoes from one day to the other right. and you learn so much and then you become a friend because a woman talking about food with another woman, right. it's a big door opener. And I remember, you know, one day in Ecuador, I was in a community, a very interesting community, by the way. It is a community that is um, uh, made out of people from African descent mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. Ecuador. Mm -hmm. um, We're everywhere. Uh -huh, yes, <laughs> but it is. A, these yes. are very remote, isolated mm -hmm places where they have them the in the slaves. Philippines also. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So we had this meeting with the group and when I was about to leave, I was about to step in the car. Uh, we have had a wonderful encounter with these women and 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 you know, we had a wonderful conversation. Mm -hmm. This one woman runs after me and says, "Can I ask you something?" I said, "Yeah, sure. How can I do not to have so many children?" 
Oh, birth control. See, yes, but she dared asking it to me in a very private and confidential way because mm -hmm. we had established a trust relationship. And then I told her, I gave her the advice of what to do, meaning she has to go to the local health center mm -hmm. and talk to the medical staff there. But um, this shows how, although me being a white woman among the black women, mm -hmm. we had a wonderful connection. And I remember when we left, this one woman from Esmeraldas, that's the province in mm -hmm. Ecuador where these uh, black people live, the one woman came to me and she said, Hannah, you have the heart of a black woman, <laughs> she said. And to and me... What, what do you think made, that made her say that? Because she realized that I was a non-judgmental person, mm -hmm. that I was a global mother. The global mm -hmm. means for everybody. Right. And I was, um, I was, I, I loved these people and I right. wanted to be close to them. And yeah. I did everything that I could to help them mm -hmm. and improve their livelihoods and bring food to the children and fight for their needs and their rights. And so, but that for me was part of what I was meant to do. Right. It's not that it was, you know, anything special. I didn't expect any reward right. for what I was doing. It was just right. Right. Uh, but what a wonderful opportunity to be doing things that are right. I, I agree. That, I, I totally agree with that. <laughs> so, you know, you you had uh, made a comment about, um, you know, these women, they hold, I'm just going to paraphrase and say life in their hand because they're so powerful. I remember being in Haiti. I've been to Haiti seven times before the um, the earthquake and I was dating an Haitian guy at the time. <laughs> 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 and so we were driving around in the car and I says, I'm so hungry, I want breakfast. And he like, he, said, he knew where to go. And he, he goes, oh, do you want eggs? And I said, yeah, I want some boiled eggs. And so we go down to this market and he comes and jumps out of the car and he goes over to this woman and she's sitting on, you know, sort of on a mat thing. And he tells her what I want. He gives her, she gives him, he gives her money and she gives him boiled eggs. And he comes back to the car and I have my boiled eggs. I got my boiled eggs, right? And so while I was driving through this market and driving through Haiti, what came to my mind was that women like of the world, you know how they sit in the market and they've got their baskets down there and they've got their legs open like that and they're counting their money and doing whatever it is they're doing. It's like women literally hold life between their legs, mm -hmm. like not just in the form of the sex and babies, mm -hmm. but in terms of commerce and survival of mm -hmm. families and communities and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's what, when you mentioned that, it really sort of brought back to mm -hmm. mind mm -hmm. that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is indeed such an important uh, knowledge and understanding because uh, what we learn in development is you can't make development uh, with ignoring one half of the population right. and not understanding the reality of each group. And women are agents of change. Absolutely. They are agents of change here and they are there everywhere. as well. Everywhere. everywhere. Yes. everywhere absolutely so like yeah so now so you're 26 you're doing all this stuff you're traveling all over the world you're making a difference and like but what was it that what was it that spawned your now project let's step into that world okay it, it, so your project is called this project now yeah, palms yeah, yeah. for life fund mm -hmm. which is a non-for-profit mm -hmm. established here in the u.s mm -hmm. under what's called the 501c3 so mm -hmm. we have a status by the irs for operating as a dot org right. um we have the capacity to collect uh, donations mm -hmm. um that are tax deductible right. um and we you know there's 1.5 million not-for-profit organizations in this country one point million. This is amazing. You know, America is one of the most generous country in the world. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you well, compare... I should hope so. We're oh, one yes. of the richest countries in the world. Yes, but there is the individual generosity. Mm -hmm. It's not only the governments donating from one government to the other a certain percentage of their income uh, or their gross income, which, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes countries are compared. How much do they give from their gross income? Right to development and in the u.s that percentage is not necessarily so large but what individual americans right. donate and how generous american people are this is unique this right. you don't find in those the rest are, of the those world. are our qualities yeah oh 
yeah. amazing. I mean, you can really reach American people in their heart and get them to. But we're still greedy. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. we still know, like big yeah. food. Yeah, <laughs> when well, we go abroad, it's like, where's the food? Is that, it? <laughs> that was me on vacation. I realized I had become a greedy piglet American, which I'm okay with. <laughs> no, but, but no, uh, Americans are extremely generous. Absolutely. In the money, when there's mm -hmm. a need, money comes following in. You Absolutely. just have to ask. Yeah, you have to ask. But we see now, then, as we talk about what is. Um, what is so important for Palms for Life is mm -hmm. actually that famous money that mm -hmm. you talk about. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, what I want is for people to understand better the kind of work that we do. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity, for instance, to be here with you today on this show is excellent for me. It's perfect because I want people to know me better right. and to understand. So how can we and, know you better? Uh -huh. Even, By doing like what you a do. A couple of seconds <laughs> to do that and then we got a break and come back. So how can we know you better? Just leave them with a cliffhanger. <laughs> well, by asking all the questions that you ask, I will ask questions. by uh, giving me that mic, um, okay. and um, and and for recognizing that I have a voice. Great, awesome. So we'll be right back. You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network. <laughs> Do you like comic books and movies? How about TV and pop culture? Then you've come to the right place. Hi, I'm Michael Dolce, host of Secrets of the Sire. Joined every week by my co-host, Hassan, Lord of the Radio Godwin. Together, we have over 15 years' experience creating graphic novels, screenplays, and more. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on the pop culture universe you love to talk about. Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern, talkradio.nyc. Are you feeling unhappy with your body, shape, or size? Ever feel out of control with food? I'm Elizabeth Tripp, your host of Nourish the Soul. Join me to uncover the root to these imbalances and discover a permanent solution to living a healthy life. Join us every Wednesday at my new time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on talkradio.nyc. Talking Alternative Radio, 24 hours a day. So we're back. This is Noreen Sumter from Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way. And I'm with Hannah Loffer Rotman, who is the founder of Palms for Life. And also you're a founder of the a film forum, a film festival, right? Faces of Hunger Film, film Festival. Correct. Right. So tell me, tell me about um, Palms for Life. How did you come up with the name? It sounds very godly. Uh -huh. no, thank you. Well, um, I was you know, working. It reminds me of Palm Sunday. Oh, I see. Well, yeah. when you look at our logo, you see that it has a shape of two. Originally, it was like two hands mm -hmm. getting together. Mm -hmm. And the palms for life, the idea behind it is, is um, you give, I receive, we join hands, we join our efforts, right. and we can give life. And the image of palms, palm trees, is a very uh, positive image. It's mm -hmm. an image of protection, of friendship, of fertility, of love, and of um, vacation. Of, of vacation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's a good positive image. So, I remember we had a little group um, that I established at our house. We had a lunch, and we said, after that lunch, we have to come up with a name. And so we did. We discussed and we looked at different opportunities, and suddenly this one came. Right. And it has everything that is important. It is the joining hands, um, the life idea, which right. is 
precious thing <coughs> that we all have and we all want everybody to have and everything that we do is for life is right. for a better life and right. um, in the beginning when I uh, when Palms for Life was established I thought of all those different ways where we can um, join hands and make Palms a stronger organization right. like I had for instance cooking for life, bananas for life, importing bananas from Ecuador and giving a percentage of the income of the sale from the bananas to the projects right. that we want to develop going back to Ecuador. Right. And I like to say at the time I said it's, it's beyond fair trade because fair trade is basically about the, the prices that mm -hmm. are being negotiated. But having money to go to give back to those banana growers mm -hmm. to educate their children mm -hmm. and so so i had this project banana for life then chocolate for life <laughs> uh, then art for life right. and i can tell you more actually that's one of the projects so these are all the extensions all of... the different extensions and it all the idea behind everything is that everything in Both life right. can be transformed into a positive energy right. into life so you need money right <laughs> so who doesn't need money it's like so how do you get your money well there are different ways apart from the projects that you create That's and then exactly. you put the money back into it how else do you get projects well in fact the money. projects that we create is not so simple because it goes both ways we can create a project and then be there sitting and waiting right. and not having the funds to right. put the project into motion mm -hmm. uh, so we work on different fronts one of them is to develop friendships mm -hmm. and trust relationships mm -hmm. and we have a few families that are very dear to us and that give us annually a certain amount of money that mm -hmm. is our survival mm -hmm. i always tell so them so you have benefactors we do have a few mm -hmm. a few we need more mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we could do more we could grow more if we had more funds mm -hmm. but then on the other hand what we also do is we present funding proposals when there is a call for proposals mm -hmm. by an organization like for instance the european union um is known for putting out calls for proposals on different right. subjects and right. areas that they want to develop and then they invite the ngo community mm -hmm. to present proposals well we have won two competitions oh, with the eu mm -hmm. in south uh, southern africa thank right. you um in eswatini so we have an amazing program there before the eu we were able to attract a big amount of money for a big project also mm -hmm. in eswatini uh, which is now called eswatini it's mm -hmm. a kingdom it was called swaziland okay yeah you know swaziland, swaziland of yeah. course yeah so now it's called eswatini. everything's changing everything is changing but the king of swaziland decided yeah. that eswatini was more in line with i kind of like swaziland <laughs> it's more it gives more it's, it's more boldness in the mouth <laughs> How do you say that other one? Equatini? Eswatini. Eswatini. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it sounds tiny. <laughs> well, it's, it's not uh, very full. We have to uh, get, once okay. we are used, we'll get to, used to it. You know. yeah. But anyway, so there <clears throat> I found funds from the US government. So that was also an opportunity that we uh, presented a proposal to and we won that competition. So, so how, do you, how do you find, um, are you combing through? periodicals or how are you finding this? there are um, there are search engines right. and um, you have to look sometimes people come to you and say look there is an opportunity there why don't you apply which I have done a lot in the last since Palms for Life was founded mm -hmm. in 2006 we mm -hmm. have done a lot of what we call writing funding proposals right. I think we are very good at doing that. We well, should be by now. We are very good, yes, because you know, I have my 30 years of having worked with the UN right. on projects and I've learned. You know, I, I'm not shy about the fact that I'm an expert in this, in this field. Right. I know what a good development project looks like. Right. But you see, I'm not the only one. There are another three, four, five thousand people who also know that yes. and also present proposals. And, and the number of no's that we get after we submit a funding proposal is devastating. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's such a big effort to write those projects and to connect with people and say, what do you think is a good one? I mean, it's a lot of work. And right. then to receive a no is, oh, no. Mm -hmm. 
But you keep on, you pull your socks and up then, and you get going again. Yes, but now I'm trying to do things a little bit different. And what, that, what does that different look like? The difference is that, like for instance, you know, we have an amazing, beautiful story mm -hmm. about another country in Southern Africa called Namibia. Yeah, you might know yes. Namibia. It's a very special, interesting country. I've been there once. Mm -hmm. I met a person who wanted who has funds, he's very wealthy. Mm -hmm. And we, there is a long story about how we finally Give me the connected. short version, we only have an hour. <laughs> the short version is we connected. Mm -hmm. He liked what we were doing. Mm -hmm. He trusted me and mm -hmm. he said, look, I want to develop a project in Namibia mm -hmm. for the San people. The sand, sand, sand S A N, sand people. The oh. sand people. Okay. The sand people is a is a group, is an ethnic group mm -hmm. that exists for many, many. I mean, they are the genetic one of the genetic founders of humanity. Are they the little tiny people? The, the bushmen. Little, yes. Yeah, the bushmen. Okay, yes. got it. It's a derogative term, right. no, so I, yeah. people don't use anymore. Although many people still use right. the word bushmen. But, it's but that's the, how we know them, right? And I wouldn't say yes, exactly. No, of course. But I, I call them the yes. tiny people because yes. they're very small. Yes, and you have seen the, some yes. films about yes. them, yeah, which they don't necessarily support. I mean, they don't think it's an accurate vision of no. who they are. But they are a very interesting group, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, they have suffered a lot throughout history. Mm -hmm. And that man, who is this very wealthy individual, says, "I want to do something for the sand." children mm -hmm. in Namibia mm -hmm. and I don't know how to do it. I have nobody who can do that for me. I said, I'm taking the challenge. Right. I'll do that for you. Right. I've never been to Namibia, I've, but I started moving everything I could. I contacted UNICEF. I have an ongoing relationship with UNICEF. I know them. It's UN. So UNICEF, other people. I did all my research. Long story short, last July, mm -hmm. I was officially invited by the government of Namibia to present a first report that reproduced about the situation of the San children. Mm -hmm. Dramatic, horrible situation, mm -hmm. poverty, mm -hmm. genocide, mm -hmm. marginalization, everything that you can imagine that goes wrong with the people, the women, the mm -hmm. children, the young girls. I mean, it's what's the population of the San people? The San people mm -hmm. live in Namibia, mm -hmm. in Botswana, mm -hmm. and in South Africa. Right. The numbers, there are different groups. In fact, it is a large group made out of several different ethnic, sub-ethnic groups. Right. So in Namibia, there are maybe 60,000 people San, all together. 60,000 San people? San people. Oh, okay. And they have lost their land. Many live in settlements. Some still have been re because they were in the desert, right? They, they, they mostly live in yes, the desert. There are two deserts actually mm -hmm. in Namibia. And so they they live in different parts. And um and in Botswana the same mm -hmm. and in South Africa also. And they have their language still. Mm -hmm. They altogether I'm told there are about 30 sand languages still alive. Wow. Not dialects, languages, right. they, to the point where they don't even understand each other. Um, so different yeah. those languages are. But now, so after we produced that report and the government invited us, that person, the generous man mm -hmm. who is who lives here in mm -hmm. New York, he is putting the money into that project. Oh, cool. So it's not anymore me going out and begging and looking, you looking to, yeah, for an opportunity. You, you got that project set. He wants us to do things right. that where everybody's winning right for me because palms for life has an opportunity and it's it's not that i can cover it. i can talk about the whole world but i right. can't do things so question world. i have another question yes. so of the contributions that you get what is the percentage that goes into your projects well um normally in the case of the funds you receive from the eu mm -hmm. it's 93 percent oh good so seven percent can be as per their rules can be used as overhead right and so then we can get that seven percent overhead to support our administrative expenses right. but um recently they even lowered it to three percent right um when we get private donations when we get private donations i try as much as possible those small private donations to support us 
here because okay. we have right. a few people, we have right. an office, you know, we need some, we have some admin expenses. Right. So you have, you, you're run by not-for-profit volunteers mostly? I have interns. We have here in the U.S., we have two and a half people on the payroll. Mm -hmm. That's it. The others are interns. Mm -hmm. In Swaziland, we have a big office in Eswatini. Mm -hmm. We have a big office. There were moments where we had 16, 17 people, but they are all paid by project money, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. by directly our right, funds. Got it. So this is, how, this is how we operate. But in general, I would say that almost 100% of the funds that we receive for projects mm -hmm. go to the project. And I like for donors to understand that they have to they have the choice between right. to project to or, a project or administration <clears throat> exactly or to an administration of both right in fact ideally they should realize we can't run a project if we don't have exactly the funds. i remember um because i used to work in not for profit and one of the the a lot of the money that i when i did work in not for profit used to go to administ a lot of the money went to administration and um you know, I, so I've become very sort of cautious in who and where I donate my funds to. And if it's not at least 90%, I'm not interested. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's wonderful. I think this is an important information. You know, the, um, there is, I think, official data that you can find on the internet about how much the NGOs charge mm -hmm. as overhead. And some go as high as 80% yeah, overhead. And I then, know. We, you know. Who will remain nameless. And, yeah, and those are indicators yes. of, you know, <laughs> do, you, do we need that? Right. So we're going to take a break and we'll be right back. <laughs> You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network. The best designs for your life start at home. I'm David Thiergartner, interior designer and host of At Home. Listen live Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Time as we talk to the very best professionals about interior design and the design that's all around us, right here on talkradio.nyc. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you feeling unhappy with your body, shape, or size? Ever feel out of control with food? I'm Elizabeth Tripp, your host of Nourish the Soul. Join me to uncover the root to these imbalances and discover a permanent solution to living a healthy life. Join us every Wednesday at my new time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on talkradio.nyc. TalkingAlternative.com we're back. This is Noreen Sumter on Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way. And I am speaking tonight with Hannah Lofer Rotman. <laughs> I did it right. So, <laughs> so Hannah, on the break, um, you mentioned food, you know, so um, let's just pump, jump into that. You have a um, organization and a film festival, Faces of Hunger Film Festival. So how does that tie in with food? Oh, 
very interesting. Thank you for that question. Well, it first goes back to what we started our conversation with, which mm -hmm. was global mother. What mm -hmm. does the global mother do? She feeds her children. Yes. Okay, so um, that's one of my big passions. Mm -hmm. I worked with the UN World Food Program mm -hmm. for almost 30 years mm -hmm. in many countries, twice in Ecuador, Ecuador is a little bit like a home country for us because my children actually spend most of their young life in, in Ecuador. Ecuador, five years once, five another five years, amazing experience there. So um, when I started Palms for Life in the U.S., I decided that in the U.S., I, while I would work internationally on all the issues that we talk about, you know, the education, access to water, mm -hmm. sanitation, all of that, in the U.S., we would focus on food and hunger. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's more um, labeled as food insecurity. And okay. why? It's because the numbers of people in America... Food insecurity. Yes. Food insecurity. What does that mean? Yeah, what does you that could, mean? You, know, it's, you would say, yes, is it a politically correct way of talking about hunger? In certain cases, yes. But in the a definition, a softer definition is that it means that, in this case, more than 45 million Americans, mm -hmm. of which maybe 11 million are children, mm -hmm. do experience moments throughout the year where they don't have enough food, right. or where they have to make choices between okay. paying the rent or eating. Okay. So there is a large number I'm, I'm of American note. people. When you go on the website of the US Department of Agriculture, mm -hmm. You can find the official data. Every year it changes. But I have, when we started talking about hunger in America, it was 50 million Americans, 15 million children. It went down a little bit, 48 million Americans. So the official data about mm -hmm. who are those families and also where do those families who are food insecure, mm -hmm. where do they live? And in which state is mm -hmm. there more food insecurity? And where is it? Well, I don't have the numbers oh, oh, here right okay. now, but it's certainly the southern states right. have much more food insecurity than the other <laughs> food states. Food insecurity, that sounds really food weird. Food insecurity. I, I mean, know, it it's, it's a weird statement. It is an amazing statement. So, you know, because I'm a foodie mm -hmm. and because it's such an important subject to me, I said, let's do something. It's not that I'm going to feed 48 million Americans, but mm -hmm. let's at least talk right. about it. Let's raise raise the level of awareness mm -hmm. about the fact that so many Americans, too many Americans, experience insufficient food access throughout the year. Adults, children, it's wrong. So let me ask a question um, because I there's a food pantry in my community in Clinton Hill. It's been there for like I don't know. I didn't even know it, what it was. I'd ride by in a car. And uh, for years, and I had no idea what it was, people standing outside this church building, getting food, all kinds of people. And um, one day a friend of mine said to her, do you want to get some free food? She said to me, you want to get some free food? And I said, what kind of food? She said, free food. So I said, I'll come with you. And so it was this place that I've been driving by for years, right? And so what they do is on um, Sundays, they give away a lot of produce, right, which is, greens and vegetables and stuff like that and during the course of the week they give away um a process like like i don't know what you call it but cans or cans good cereal rice or dry food let's say. um they give away some meats they give away juice and more vegetables or all kinds of stuff right and honestly i will tell you that they say that they have more food than they have people Right. And so I did like a survey how many pantries are in New York. So this is a lot of pantries. I can't remember the number completely because I did it for a friend of mine. But there are a lot of pantries, food pantries, where organizations like Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or farmers and all kinds of, they drop off food in these pantries because I know some of the food that is in that pantry comes from the farmer's, farmer's market on a Saturday, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So the farmer market comes to Brooklyn on Saturday and they drop off stuff. I mean, I guess they don't want to take it home. They drop off stuff in the mountains, really good stuff, stuff that I would go to the farmer's market and actually buy, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I, if, there's, if, if there's access to food, but there's not enough people to get this food, then what? 
Well, you see, this, this is one of the things that doesn't go very well in the system, in the food system in mm -hmm. America, in the United States. Um, there is something wrong with a system where people cannot, in a dignifying way, go to the store, have enough income, buy the food that yeah. they need, go home and prepare it like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Why do some people have to stand in a line, go to a pantry, receive the food as a, in the form of a handout? It's a not a very dignifying yeah. experience. We have to do it. And you know, I am... You don't have to. No. In, Th there's but, no have to no, at that pantry. To. And I, no. I, I asked no. them, I've asked them, I said, can anybody get this food? And they're like, yeah, anybody can get this food. Yeah. I said, can I get this food? And they were like, yeah, you can get this food. And I got the food for a little while, and then I just didn't want to stand in line anymore, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it was like, if somebody doesn't get the food, the rest of it goes to waste. Yes, exactly, I know. So there's mm -hmm. somehow there's the communication about it is not mm -hmm. reaching out mm -hmm. to the populace. I didn't know about it, and I drove by this place for years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, and some of that food was really good. Oh yes, I'm sure it must be. <laughs> no, it's must be totally the farmer stuff is wonderful, right? Yeah. It's really fresh, it's really green, yeah. it's great, and it's organic. Oh, so right? good, yes. And there's all the other crap yeah. as well. But and you don't want to know about food being thrown away, which right. is already big. I mean, the topic of food waste. Yeah, but I, I was reading something huge. where they was there's a European country that they have these food sort of like bank stuff, like they don't. It was something, it's a new law that came into effect or something that organizations, supermarkets are not allowed to throw out food, good food anymore. They have to get it to these special banks. I can't remember what it is, but I saw it like a couple of weeks ago. And um, so these, these, and it's not, it's a European, it's European countries that are creating this access so that they, people can get food. Mm -hmm. How comes we can't do something like that mm -hmm. here? Absolutely. I mean, we can certainly learn from many countries because many countries have found... We have other, a lot of food. Yes. I mean, like, there's so much food here. And as I said, there is this problem of waste. But the main problem I think that has to be addressed is how can we ensure that people who need the food have access to the food in the most dignifying way? How come that so many places in America are called food deserts? There is no fresh food to be seen. Nobody can get a lettuce. Nobody can get anything green. Only, what the only thing they get are canned goods of poor quality. They can't get anything organic. If they want to get something of health, a healthy food, they have to drive, which costs a lot. Where right. is this? The, how do you call this? The footprints uh, about people right. having to drive many, many miles in order to go to a store, and then it costs more money. People have an income problem, so they don't go to buy the fresh food. So, do you think this? Do you think this issue will ever be resolved on the planet? On the planet, I uh, we hope so, um, but I am sure that there is there is a lot of work. There is a lot of effort um, that is happening right now. People who get together and try to find creative ways. I think the young people are coming together to find creative Absolutely. ways to support and help. Yes. And I think mm -hmm. that, I think they're doing a great job. You know, a lot of people don't like millennials, but I think they're awesome. Absolutely. Because they are actually yes. changing structures. And you know, precisely under that Faces of Hunger film festival, what we did on October 16, which was World Food Day, mm -hmm. uh, we got um, a partnership with an organization called Universities Fighting World Hunger. Mm -hmm. And they have chapters with hundreds of universities all over the U.S. We worked with them and we had 32 universities in the U.S. who signed up to have access to the films and they screened those films among the students, mm -hmm. universities, mm -hmm. the millennials, mm -hmm. and then we gave them discussion guides. So they showed the films, they had the discussion, um, and they decided how they can get together and do something right. to work on food and hunger and all those complex issues around food. Mm -hmm. So this is under the faces of So we have those films, and we give them to people to watch and to discuss. And at least, as I said, if we, if we don't, solve the issue of world hunger, we can at least raise the level of awareness and have people 
become more alert, more ready to do something, more, <laughs> more conscious I, about their own environment. So this conversation of world hunger, <laughs> I think the word, it needs to be changed, the, the, the conversation, the, the title needs to be shifted to a higher vibration for one, world <laughs> hunger, because that doesn't say, it says oh, the world's going to be hungry instead of like, you know, feeding the world or something like that. Yeah. Um, has been a topic of conversation ever since I was like five years old. Yeah. You know, as, yeah. and that's as far back as I can remember. And I'm 55 now. Mm -hmm. Am I? Yeah, 55. <laughs> right. And um, it's like, it used to be, oh, eat your food because there's kids in Biafra that are starving. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> that's right. I'll be like, mom, put it in an envelope and send it to them. I'm not eating. <laughs> but this is a conversation that's been going on for 50 years, as far as I know, mm -hmm. in my lifetime, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I want to know, when is this going to be a conversation of, like, we fed the world, we're feeding the world, and, you know. And then there's also the side of, we're going to take a break. I was going into a tangent. Oh, we're over. Oh, bloody hell. That was a really great show. <laughs> We've come to the end so rapidly um because it was a really great show i just want to say thank, thank you. you for coming on thank you i wish Noreen. we had more time but yes we don't. yes and uh thank you thank you very much and thank you. you for listening and i'll see you next week on beyond potential live life your way oopsie bye you're listening to the talking alternative network ding, 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 ding.